Ah, hello World Wide Web. I'm Rekha Shadow, the Internet Personality of this hair. And honestly, I've been meaning to review this one for a while. The Lawnmower Man from 1992. While some editions say it's based on the Stephen King's short story of the same name, eh, the truth is that New Line Cinema simply got the movie rights to the Stephen King's story, then slapped their name on another movie they were already making, Cyber God. So, King sued them and got $10 million out of the deal, so not bad. But sadly, this does mean we will likely never actually see the movie about the guy who eats lawn clippings in the nude with cloven feet, probably in Maine. What we did get is one of the examples of how VR obsessed the 90s truly were, as The Lawnmower Man is a story about virtual reality, the strange mystical future technology that will change life as we know it, probably sometime around the distant future year of 2001. But the tech could be used to enhance brain power or even control minds. Or it took until the 2020s for it to come out, and when we finally did get it, they can't even get feet right. But nonetheless, let's take a look at the Lawnmower Man. Just as soon as we take a shot of Dramamine. Well, first let's point out, hey, this is the director's cut. About half an hour longer, and some parts don't mesh quite perfectly. But don't let that bother you. With that out of the way, the movie can start proper, with another text box explaining this newfangled virtual reality stuff. Bullet points, uh, virtual reality just got invented, it's really cool, but it, it could be used for mind control. Somehow. Also, hey, the Maine VR Research Institute just so happens to be a military installation. The head of the project, Lawrence Angelo, played by Pierce Brosnan, argues with Sebastian Timms, played by Mark Brinkelson, that the military should stop pushing for military applications for this technology. Angelo just wants to make the test chimp Roscoe smarter. They don't care about his intelligence enhancement. They want his primal ring centers fully stimulated. He is to be battlefield ready. Oh, face it, you're already giving the chimp a gun. I'm on team military here. You don't need to go full Planet of the Apes with this. So it's on to the VR training, which uh, looks uh, absolutely ridiculous. I mean, for 1992, it, it, it does look good. It, it's, it's just, you know, there's 10 minutes of this stuff in the movie, and it cost half a million dollars to make, and, uh, well... Hellblade 2 it ain't. But it's realistic enough for this ape, and with his increased intelligence and violent video game training, he expertly picks the lock of his cage and knows just what to do. Get a gun, shoot everyone, and use handy dandy key cards to find his way to the exit. <laughs> Because the next thing you know, Dr. Angelo gets a call and wouldn't you know it. Yeah, hello. Oh. Larry, it's Tim's. Yeah. Your chimp's dead. What? It tried uh, to escape. When? Fun fact, in the director's cut, he's not actually dead yet. Also, this particular goof only actually exists in the 2017 Blu-ray re-release of this movie. So that tells you which version I got. We've got a whole other scene included in the director's cut that very much expresses the chimp is still alive, as yes, he was shot, but he managed to escape and find his way to a church, where he runs into the landscaper, Job Smith, played by Jeff Fahey. Job believes this to be Cyboman, his favorite comic book hero. However, the ape is ready to kick off Caesar's revolution, but Bright Eyes over here isn't the least bit threatening, so he changes his mind. But what's this? Helicopters circle above! Is that the bad guys? could hide in my shed, Cyberman. Nobody could find you there. I could point out the absurdity of that line of thinking, but according to the movie itself, this guy is an absolute fucking idiot, so it shouldn't surprise us that he's only slightly more intelligent than your average horror movie protagonist. But the ape doesn't know much better yet either, so in the shed they go. Now it's time to establish the important plot points. You know, Cyberman, <laughs> if you want, you could, you could call me Lawnmower Man. Everybody does. Gotta work real quick to hammer that point home, otherwise people are gonna talk all the time about how the movie just... The title doesn't make a lick of sense. They call him the Lawnmower Man because he mows lawns with a lawnmower and is a man. Shocking revelations, I know. But he lives here in the shack on the grounds of St. Anthony's Church, led by Father McKean, played by Jeremy Slate. Currently, he's annoyed that Job has failed to keep the church in order. But as Father McKean approaches Job's shed, he hears strange noises. <laughs> Man, when I peeked through the window to see Joe playing with his monkey, I did not expect that. 
Thus he calls the police, and naturally the government goons learn about the call and respond to it long before the police arrive. Thus Job's shed is surrounded by gunmen, under the order of Tim's, while Dr. Angelo begs him to just trank the damn animal. But that wouldn't be nearly traumatizing enough, so they open fire, blowing the ape away! Pissing away the millions of dollars the ape was worth, and traumatizing the fuck out of Job to boot. Come on, Job! Yes, yes, Job, but you see, the key word there is was. So Dr. Angelo is down an ape, and all the higher-ups intend to do is Operation Scrubbing Bubbles. Hell, even Father McKean seems more concerned about what this means for the future. After all, this terrible event could mean his lawnmower man might... Uh, well, fucking whip the little bastard! Because nothing says penance and forgiveness quite like physical and psychological abuse. Oh, and as a side note, while there is more in The Lawnmower Man from the Stephen King short story, The Lawnmower Man, than people give it credit for, this actually isn't one of them. Strange, I know, they found the one Stephen King story without evil religious people, and the movie adaptation, not adaptation, actually includes them. But things are getting serious, so Pierce Brosnan whips out his chest, sips on some whiskey, and muses over the implications of the events that have transpired. Kissing their asses anymore. No. He will not bow down to the government goons any longer. Except, you know, when he when he has to for the plot to progress. But that's just a thought that counts. Anyway, it's time for the start of the next day. Terry McKean comes down, brother of Father McKean, played by Jeffrey Lewis, to grab Job and get ready for some lawn mowing, man. Not only that, look, Job has repaired the badass power lawnmower, Big Red. So he's ready for his job. And Dr. Angelo is quitting his, telling Tim's he can't work in these conditions. They want to suppress my work. The potentials for human advancement are endless. Virtual reality holds a key to the evolution of the human mind, and that's my focus. Really? I mean, I mean, people just usually, I mean, use it for porn. Tim's reasons with him like, look, your motivations for quitting are nice and all, but we still got like two hours of movie left, so tell you what. You quit now, and when you're ready to get the plot moving again, the evil military government secret science experiments will be right here waiting for you. Anywho, Terry and Job gotta get some gas for the mowers, giving us a chance to introduce Jake Simpson, played by John Laughlin. He's a clear antagonist for this tale, smoking by the gas pumps and laughing in Job's face when he says that Cybo Man came to see him the other day. Speaking of Cybo Man, though, Dr. Angelo is taking his break from VR by dicking around in VR, much to the chagrin of his wife, Caroline, played by Colleen Coffey. <laughs> God damn it, Carol, I never unplug a program when I'm engaged. Well, it's not her fault you never bothered to implement a pause button. She's upset that he forgot that he promised to take her to the city. But he's like, yeah, I really don't feel like it. That involves people and talking and bleh. I'm going through a lot of changes right now. Well, I'm going through a lot of changes too. You're too obsessed with your work to even notice. And as far as I can tell throughout the movie, her changes involve her location, because she decides to just say fuck it and leave. Temporarily in the director's cut, but permanently in the theatrical version. Either way, she's going to the city without him, right after we introduce the rest of the gang. Job is outside mowing the grass, allowing us to establish he is good friends with the neighbor kid, Peter Parquette, played by Austin O'Brien, and on friendly terms with the kid's mother, Carla, played by Rosalie Mayux. But they both live in fear of the abusive alcoholic father, Harold, played by Ray Likens. And hey, we finally got something from the original Stephen King story. Harold Parkett was kind of the protagonist of The Lawnmower Man. And considerably less of an asshole in the original. Either way, it's time for Dr. Angelo to ask the real questions. Why did Roscoe bond with this retarded man? Well, dropping more hard R's than Linus in the 90s. But more importantly, how is Dr. Angelo to continue his work without his chimp? A human subject would be best, but where is he supposed to find a human who is about as good as a smart chimp? Of course, the landscaper. He is about as bright as a member of the great ape family. Wasting no time, Dr. Angelo scoops Job up and takes him inside to some of those handed anti chimp intelligence test games, which Job struggles at, to say the least. But after enough of this, Let's play another game. That just throws his ass right into a ridiculous virtual reality race with hypothetical instruction. 
Perhaps not too surprising, Job can't figure out what the hell is going on here, and as such fails miserably. But eh, no reason to let that bother you too much when Dr. Angelo has just the thing to help. I have other... different games. I even have one that could help make you smarter. It's a hell of a way to wean the guy onto Mavis Beacon teaches typing. Dr. Angelo has to sell Job on the idea of intelligence, saying that if he were smarter, people couldn't take advantage of him. As if people who believe themselves too sharp to be tricked aren't the easiest to deceive. For instance, to keep this project secret, Dr. Angelo convinces Father McKean that he's going to be taking Job inside for hours and hours because Job is helping to remodel his house. Now, of course, the first step to getting anywhere with edutainment is to shoot up some drugs. Look over there. Look over there. Ah! Ah! It didn't hurt. Ah, sorry, must have been a scream of comfort. Now to complete expanding his mind, Job is strapped into the Valve Index and Dr. Angelo blasts his eyeballs with incomprehensible gibberish. Which might not make any sense in terms of something that would actually help make him smarter, but it's a lot more entertaining than watching four hours of Dr. Angelo struggling to tell Job, Re is for Ringo. So as the weeks go on, so do the treatments, Dr. Angelo upping the drugs in intensity to maximize Job's intellectual development. Which results in him having a seizure, but hey, you want to make an omelette, you gotta put a few brains on drugs. The seizure was mild. And if I can keep tighter control over the stem floor, I should be able to prevent it from happening again. Hey, don't slow down now, just hit the nitrous to get past that pesky blind turn. But things are just going too good to stop now. Job is reading, driving, and most importantly of all, kicking ass and taking names in video games. Congratulations. You just graduated to the next level, Job. Ha! <laughs> Get it? Because, because games and levels, it's like... Mario... Well, I'll let myself out. So what's level two? Why, this secret military research facility hidden in the mountains, of course. Just gotta convince Tim's over there. I've gone as far as I can in my lab at home. I need access to the main lab here to go further. There's no telling how far I can take, Job. Now we ran the RTX cards to the maximum, but I'm sorry, I don't have any military-grade server blades hidden away in my garage. To your knowledge, even better. Dr. Angelo wants to get publishable results without the higher-ups hearing about it. Therefore, getting the military-grade benefits without the military-grade expectations. It's win-win! So Tim's agrees to keep this on the down low, and Dr. Angelo takes Job for a trip to the mountains. Are you gonna do to me what you did to the chimp? Well, yes and no. I mean, I'm... I'm not gonna put you in a cage, Job. <laughs> but I am probably gonna kill you. Ah, who cares about military this and acceptable losses that, when you got full body virtual reality with cyber suits and brain wires that link to something, it's as the kids say, immersive. Sometimes, I think I've discovered a new planet. But what I'm inventing instead of discovering. Oh yeah, we've heard this all before, Todd Howard. So they strap him in and Dr. Angelo blasts bits of brilliance into his brain. This results in a whole lot of spinning around and Joe becoming smarter. Which has the natural effect that any of us cerebrally gifted individuals can attest to. It's so hot today, Joe. Why don't you come up for a cold glass of lemonade? It makes him incredibly sexy with women just throwing themselves at him. Any day now. This would be Marnie Burke, played by Jenny Wright. There's a character backstory here. She had a husband, he died, she's wealthy but unfulfilled. Point is, now she's boning the landscaper. That's swell, but you know what Job really likes? Educational CD-ROM technology. Dr. Angelo is like, hey, Job, use the floaty mouse and the tiger R-Zone to play these discs. I'll be back in a few hours to see how you're doing. I went through the whole series up to the American Revolution. <laughs> That's 100 hours of programming. Yeah. I figured out how to increase the baud rate. Each disc only took two minutes. He found the fast forward button. Job even shows Dr. Angelo that yes, he did retain all that information. According to Job, this technology that transformed his mind is on a whole other level, making slower information absorption like books obsolete. Nothing left to do but have a celebratory joy ride with Peter and take him down to the diner for burgers and fries. Do you want to check out the comics first? No, I give them up, Peter. No way. Yeah. Okay, okay, so smart people don't like comic books, and are incredibly attracted to the opposite sex. Am I getting that right? 
But when Job tells Peter he's giving his old comic collection to the lad, suddenly Job has terrible brain pain, and even worse. I hope he doesn't puke on the counter. What's wrong with that? He can hear people's thoughts! Okay, so it's magic brain power. That explains everything. Therefore, the best course of action is to leave Peter behind and drive off so that he can check in with his doctor. Is Dr. Is Dr. Angela Hope? Yeah, he is. The asshole's probably jacking off with his computer. Ah, oh, come on, Caroline. You've known this man how long and you're still thinking things like probably? Dr. Angelo's like, wow, psychic powers, that's amazing. Probably the result of your accelerated learning. On that note, how about more accelerated learning? Tim's, however, certainly notices that Job is becoming incredibly smart, incredibly fast, and as such, betrays Dr. Angelo's trust and reports this information to the director, played by Dean Norris. Unsurprisingly, he's like, neat, maybe shoot him up with the desire to murder drug, see what that does. The aggression vectors in Project 5 caused violent that was reactions. That was an Tim's. We want to know what effect it will have on a human subject. Okay, so is Job getting smarter, or is it that everyone else in the world is getting incredibly stupid? So Tim's doesn't tell Angelo, but instead secretly swaps the drugs. And let's hope no one in the lab can tell the difference between the blue smart drug and the red murder drug. But he also changes the VR program to kill mode, which Dr. Angelo somehow doesn't notice. At least until Job starts having a seizure and they have to unplug. Still, he doesn't catch on, figuring that it was just that he was pushing the poor kid too much. That's it. No more VR until he figures this out which you'd think would mean that he'd look into it, realize that instead of learning EXE, it's set to homicidaltendencies.gov, but uh, no, no, he, he never quite picks up on that. Joe feels he's just scared of the progress he's made, that it's gone beyond what Dr. Angelo can understand. That's not important right now anyway. Look, we've reached that weird SVR bonkin' scene. <laughs> Job tells Marine that he can read her thoughts and he knows about her freaky fantasies and can make them all come true. Then he just waltzes her into that top secret high security military virtual reality research facility hidden in the mountains because if the security actually existed for this scene, then it wouldn't happen. Strapping her into the suit, they proceed to film the most expensive sex scene known to man. You're beautiful. which also doubles as the least arousing, and potentially the weirdest, as their VR fornicative frolic results in them becoming one being, a strange human dragonfly thing, before Job tosses her ass into a planet of goo, turns into a hideous monster, and vomits CGI effects all over her face. The experience effectively destroys her mind. Dr. Angela said nothing could happen. Uh, yeah, but based on his relationship with his wife, I'm pretty sure he never tested the suits this way. So the state of things right now, uh, Job can mow lawns with his frickin' mind, and Marnie can just kind of lay there and giggle. <laughs> what did Dr. Angelo do to me? You played a bunch of video games while on drugs. Far as I can tell, if you want to balance that out, you're going to need to get yourself some pizza. So Job wants to find out, but not so fast, for Tim's is like, hey, Dr. Angelo, guess what? We're gonna present your work to the board tomorrow. He's like, can't do it, not ready, which might be persuasive, if not for the fact that Tim's witnesses Job lifting a chair off the ground with nothing but the power of several barely visible strengths. But how is this even possible? This technology is simply a route to powers that conjurers and alchemists used centuries ago. It's magic! I don't gotta explain shit. So now Job has reached a terrifying stage. Smarter than Dr. Angelo and more ruthless, trying to push into his mind, telling him that they must continue the treatments. Well, that's nothing a good old-fashioned shirtless audio journal session can't fix. Have a smoke for good measure. We'll get the whiskey later. I fear for Job's sanity. This Washington trip couldn't come at a worse time. Yeah, superpowers kicking off, evil genius roaming around, but now we got that meeting tomorrow, that's important. Also, when he arrives, the board's like, so how are the new tests for the batch five on the human subject? Which catches Dr. Angelo off guard, and Tim's clarifies, <laughs> yeah, I agreed to shoot him up with the psycho killer drugs. You idiot, you goddamn idiot! My God, do you know what you have done? Wow, a reasonable response from the protagonist after the side characters ignore obvious red flags to get the plot moving. 
After raving about how absolutely ridiculous it is for the military to decide, hey, our super genius with mind powers, let's give him a strong desire for murder. Sure, that'll work out great. Dr. Angelo decides to say fuck it and leave, but not fast enough, for Job has no intention of slowing down. And either he's colorblind or still illiterate because he takes the five red vials of kill juice and shoots them right up. You know what that means? He gets his cyber suit and goes forth to get cyber revenge on all those who have wronged him. First, Father Makim. And I know it's not a huge insight in 2024 to say, hey, you know, those visual effects from 1992 kind of suck. But man, they saved the worst for last. After the priest gets adobied, Job sets his sights on Jake. Job and his lawnmower. You're a strange motherfucker. And I am too tired for this lawnmower man. A perfect opportunity for the movie to remind us it's called the lawnmower man, and yes, that is totally intentionally. And the lawnmower man uses his psychic powers to bind Jake in gas pumps before mowing his mind, smoothing his brain. Lawnmower man's in your head now, Jake. There's no escape. What's about the closest the movie gets to the original description of a lawnmower man ravenously eating the lawn clippings as he follows the lawnmower? We just get this uh, Windows 95 screensaver forever stuck in Jake's head. But oh yeah, that Stephen King story! Time to actually have a couple scenes that do legitimately represent things that happened in the story. Job heads to the Parkett residence and psychically puts Carla and little Peter to sleep. Uh, no, that's not something that happened in the original short story, but this is... <laughs> The lawnmower, mowing on its own, bursts through the front door of the Pockets' house, chasing Harold down, who tragically spills his beer. It tears through his living room, following him out the back, and launches into his face. Which means when Dr. Angelo gets back home, he's quite surprised by the police presence next door. With everyone's favorite typecast police officer, Troy Evans, here to play Lieutenant Goodwin. Of note, yes, the police response here is also not only from the story, but many lines are taken word for word from the Stephen King original. Uh, excuse me, Lieutenant. Uh, where's the rest of it? Bird bath. Did you say the bird bath? Bird bath. I feel the need to point this out because likely due to the fact that they did legit just take the name and slap it on a movie that they were already working on, there is a general consensus going around that the Lawnmower Man movie has absolutely nothing to do with the original short story. And there is a surprising amount of that story in the movie, if you know where to look. But as the officer explains to Dr. Angelo about the weird murders, suddenly he corrects himself. Weird accidents! Honestly, wild how people can just mow themselves to death. In the meantime, Job sneaks into the Angelo house, plugs himself in, and walks around some abstract churchyard, and, uh, oh, would you look at that? He's mind-controlling Caroline. As Dr. Angelo rushes downstairs, he finds that Job is freaking out! Again! Because he's also still in virtual reality. The utopia, Doctor. The utopia that men have dreamed of for a thousand years, and I'll be the conduit. But not really. It's, it's, it's kind of the half in, half out. The now what am I trying to explain anything for? It's magic, I don't know how to explain shit. Job still tries though, talking about the growth of virtual reality with the enthusiasm of Zuckerberg, that it's gonna be everywhere, it's a new dimension, yada yada. Important part is he intends to head back to the lab to transcend physical reality and become one with the machine. Once I've entered the neural net, my birth cry will be the sound of every phone on this planet ringing in unison. So his evil plan is a simply be as annoying as possible. Anyway, it's time to set up the final conflict. Job ties Dr. Angelo up, and the bad military guys show up for Job. But he sends mind-controlled Caroline at them instead, who shoots them! So they shoot her! No! Is a big no really necessary? I mean, did she like you? Even slightly? Well, I'll tell you one thing that wasn't necessary, her sacrifice, because Job can just do his special effects and take out the last two of them without any trouble whatsoever. But how will he reach the lab? What I sure been missing you, Job. Get a ride from Terry. I have no idea if he's being mind controlled or not, or maybe he's just that drunk. 
But oh look! The Parkettes are back and they rescue Dr. Angelo from his binds. Now he can join the climax. But this is a 90s climax and he's just a non-violent scientist. However, it just so happens that the bad guys came with a crate full of C4 with detonators already attached. How convenient! Oh, but the lab has security now all of a sudden. You know, now that Job's superpowers allow him to summon a massive swarm of low-fidelity bees. That allows him and Terry to slip in unharmed. <laughs> uh, well, well, mostly. I guess that ties up that loose end. Anyway, Carla brings Dr. Angelo back down to the lab, and Peter as well, because it's impossible to find a sitter in this short of notice. Speaking of short notice, we only got like 15 minutes of movie left. So Job straps into the ER, Dr. Angelo starts setting bombs left and right, and all that adrenaline must have been exhausting for Carla, who conks out long enough for Peter to head over to the lab looking for Job. But how's he doing? Oh, I'm in! I've heard of games that really suck you in, but this is a whole other level. But oh, would you look at that! Dr. Angelo cut off the network from accessing the World Wide Web. That means Job's stuck in there! Doubly so, as his body is a pile of game fuel powder and Cheeto dust from this point. So, Dr. Angelo... I can't believe this! No! I must find a way out! No. I let you do it, Job! <sighs> Jumps into VR with him. Despite him having no way of getting Job out, not wanting Job to get out, wanting to keep him in the mainframe, and having set bombs that would blow the whole place and Job with him. Why? Oh, oh <laughs> what am I saying? So this could happen. This universe is mine. I am God here. Yeah, just gotta trap himself in VR at the mercy of a mad cyber god while time bombs are taken down all around him. The battle of two intellectual giants, everybody. Job finds out about the bombs, but whoopsie, now that he's an amalgamation of algorithmic abominations, he can't affect the real world anymore. And no bother, just means he's got a time limit to find an exit out of the mainframe, and Dr. Angelo can blow the fuck up. Who cares? Job! Peter! Here. But what's this? His one and only friend will also blow the fuck up! Who also lives on that planet that Job intends to subjugate completely, but details, details. Point is, the identifiable victim effect kicks in, and he can't let Peter die! Thus, he releases Dr. Angelo, allowing him to finish off the climax the best way the 90s can. Running away from a huge explosion! Therefore, happy ending! I mean, Everything's blown up, and Dr. Angelo's wife is dead, but you know who else is dead? Carla's husband, allowing Dr. Angelo to just slide right in and take that role with that bonus-loving son, Peter to boot. How convenient! Now all that's left is to be cautious of how VR will change the world in the future. Oh, and Job survived and won. The end. Anyway, that was The Lawnmower Man. That's a classic. Science fiction about emerging technology that emerges within our lifetime and never quite lives up to the hype is effectively a genre in its own right. A glorious, cheesy action horror soup of ridiculous presumptions. In that, The Lawnmower Man is no different, with virtual reality being looked at only realistically enough to try and appear like it could exist in reality, but in practice, the rules established for VR make next to no sense and are effectively magic. Now, the movie goes out of its way to explain that, yeah, that is what the legend spoke of as magic, and we just got it back thanks to the eye-tracking and foveated rendering. Anyway, as far as the overall plot goes, I rather like The Lawnmower Man. The characters feel believable, and while we do have a tag-along kid we're supposed to get invested in, he doesn't overstay his welcome on screen or anything. 
The other pill of the lawnmower man, though, is the cliches. Oh boy, do tropes love to pop in and drive the plot when the time comes. Don't worry about the battle of geniuses being too cerebral to follow. This movie's got handy dandy C4 delivered right to your door. So what that leaves us with is a rather unique tale, a familiar story with well-presented characters using a unique twist that taps into the hot topic of the 90s, VR, as well as the primal fear of the unknown, and it's all held together with a generous slab of gunfire explosions and cartoonish cliches. But somehow, it works. Coming in at three, angry calls from Stephen King's lawyers. Out of five. I wish I could explain it better, but there's really nothing like The Lawnmower Man. Except for those mountains of movies that follow the same tropes, but don't involve VR. Thank you all for watching. I have been Decker Shadow. And remember, rest your Pierce Brosnan periodically, removing his shirt so he can breathe and provide him plenty of whiskey. Idiot! You goddamn idiot!